Hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. This time round I'm uh, looking at a car that I've wanted to do for some time actually. It's sort of been a bit of a gap in our repertoire really. But as ever, it's dependent on what comes through the door to be fixed. We don't plan, uh, we, we, we don't sort of uh, cast around for cars to do videos on. It's literally what comes in. Um, and this car is the Porsche 968 Club Sport. Um, and I've been doing a little bit of digging around these cars because we've worked on several of them over the years. In fact, if we go back to the, <coughs> the Tyrrell engineering days of when I had the business uh, in the 1990s, we'd have sort of three or four Porsche 944s in at any one time for work. They were um, sort of a, one of our regular stock in trades along with um, E30 and E36 BMWs, for example. It's amazed me how rare these cars are in the light of that. They made bet anywhere between 1300 and 1700 uh, 968 Club Sports Porsche. And of those, they made seemingly, and I can't find definitive figures, but around about 170 right-hand drive cars or a touch more. Um, so, I mean, that's a very, that's a tiny amount by Porsche uh, production car standards. When you start drilling down to that even more, it's on all the documentation from Porsche as a 968 Club Sport, um, but it does have the Lux pack. So it's, it all gets a bit confusing um, with regard to, you know, what car had what and what didn't and what constitutes a Club Sport. And it all got terribly snooty and um, my, my car is more of a Club Sport than yours is. But they're a very rare car. They made 170 odd right hand drive ever of any description. They made, as I say, around about 1500 um, altogether. So uh, yeah, a very rare car actually. The story of how this car developed, I think is the, probably exemplifies the German car industry and the German psyche far more than the, uh, than the British or, or, or throws into sharp focus the failings of the British ones sort of shows why the German car industry is in much better shape than the British one is. Um, two things. First of all, the Germans come up with a concept and refine and develop it over and over and over again. Um, they don't sort of try to reinvent the wheel as the British car industry, Alicis Agonis, um, the Mini was a success, but um, BMC, British Motor Corporation, British Leyland, apparently lost money on every one they built. Um, that happened to a lot of British cars, the Aston Martin DB6s and DB5s. Um, I mean, imagine making a car where you are, everyone comes off the production line, you're losing a little bit of money on. If you keep losing a little bit of money, you end up losing a lot of money. But um, so one of the things the Germans love to just keep evaluating and uh, improving, whereas the British tried to reinvent the wheel at every turn, and then the Germans would take that idea or the Americans and make it fantastic. Perfect example springs to mind, the de Havilland Comet, beautiful airliner, but ultimately a failure. Boeing come along, look at its weaknesses and come up with the 707, which changed the aviation world forever, really. But anyway, I'm digressing massively. The second point is that labor relations have always been very good in Germany, uh, generally speaking. The trade unions and the management get together and they sort things out, which is more than can be said for what happened in Britain in the 1970s, in particular, generally. Um, controversial comment number 101. Anyway, net result of all that is, rewind back to the early 70s, VW and Porsche, um, did a lot of collaborating because basically even now it's effectively two or three families that own most of the German motor industry and um, VW and Porsche have always gone hand in hand. VW came up with a concept in the early 70s for a, um, a sort of modestly performing entry-level Porsche sports car to take over from their previous um, modestly uh, powerful entry-level sports car which was the 914 which was, could be said to be, to be the precursor of the Boxster that came out in the 1990s. Um, but then they came up with the 924 uh, in 1975, I think, which um, was a sort of mishmash of quite a reasonably pretty car, actually, that had a, a pretty wheezy four-cylinder engine in it that was originally developed for the Audi 100 and a VW LT van. And Porsche reworked the cylinder head and put it in the 924 and it was still wheezy, 
and horrible and vibrating and nasty and um, used a fair amount of fuel and didn't go terribly fast. But the concept, this is what I'm saying, the concept was there, the roots were there, the 924 was a good canvas uh, to work from. And Porsche continued, they developed the, the 924 Turbo uh, from that, which was in fairly short production. Um, I've worked on a few of those. They're quite an interesting car, actually. But um, then we came out with the 944 in 1983, and then that uh, transmogrified over a period of time to the Porsche 968. The real turning point between the 924 and the 944 was critical. It was a much bigger turning point than between the 944 and the 968. The big difference being um, the engine. So we got rid of the wheezy old four-cylinder, two-litre engine that had started life in the Audi and the VW van. And in came um, basically a, a two and a half litre four-cylinder engine um, that was half of the Porsche 928 five-litre engine. It was a slanted inline four. Actually, it's that way. And it was half the five-litre V8. But the problem was when Porsche brought out the four-cylinder version, because it's, um, it's a big engine, uh, two and a half litres for a four-cylinder engine is, is quite big. Um, car manufacturers, engine manufacturers, generally have come up with a metric for thermodynamic efficiency, and that is roughly 500cc per cylinder. So <clears throat> you start off with a one-litre engine, um, or 1.5 litre engine which has three cylinders, a two litre engine has four cylinders, 2.5, uh, five, three litre six, four litre eight, five litre 12. And that's sort of why manufacturers in a way can't venture too far away from those figures because of that sort of, um, that's where it's at thermodynamically. But Porsche came up with this two and a half litre four cylinder engine. It's, it's as I say, it's, it's, it's abnormally big um, the good news is the frictional losses are, losses are low because you've got a four cylinder, uh, four sets of piston rings and bearings to take care of instead of five or six. But the bad news is it creates a lot of vibration. So what did Porsche do? They turned to technology from 1907 that was invented by a British engineer called um, Frederick Lanchester. He pioneered the balancer shaft, which is um, basically just, just a rod, for want of a better way of putting it, with, a, with a, an eccentric weight sticking out one side of it. And the point of that shaft is it's <clears throat> driven by uh, the, the valve gear on the front of the engine. There are actually two of them and they contra-rotate these offset weights, a bit like um, a rather larger version of the, of the vibrate mechanism that we now have in mobile phones. Same principle exactly. Um, and these balancer shafts would actually uh, counteract the, the great vibration that was caused by four large pistons popping up and down. Um, and it was quite strong, the vibration, actually. Um, so Porsche almost took, a, a lot of car manufacturers have actually taken the Lanchester balancer shaft principle and applied it. It's one shaft either side of the engine, one of them is mounted higher than the other, and one rotates clockwise, and the other one rotates anti-clockwise. That's to save them causing um, gyroscopic effects um, from rotating in the same direction inside the engine. And they cancel each other out at the top and the bottom, but they move independently in the middle. It's very, very fiendish and very clever, actually. But the net result is, um, at medium to high RPM, a lot of the vibration that the engine creates is actually eliminated, which means you don't have to have as powerful engine mountings, you don't have to, uh, life can be a lot simpler all round, but they even, Porsche even fine-tuned it. When you're driving a car and, and you, the revs build up, you're generally driving it reasonably hard. You don't do 6,000 RPM parking, for example. So the balance weights are actually engineered because the engine creates more vibration under load because of the amount of gas that's coming through it and the, the squashing effect of the piston compressing more gas. Uh, it creates more vibration under load so um, they actually engineered the weights to uh, compensate for vibration when the engine was under load and not off load. So if, if you rev one when they're stood still, you can feel a little bit of vibration through them and that disappears <coughs> on the road. 
So there's some clever engineering at work. The balancer shaft belt is actually toothed on both sides. Uh, unlike a cam belt that's toothed on one side and smooth on the other, so that the, so that it can work both uh, the ca the counterclockwise and the clockwise balancer shafts at the same time. Very clever. Porsche then that was a single overhead camshaft engine with wedge shaped combustion chambers, which were reasonably efficient, used in American V8s for decades. Um, and Porsche managed with that engine until the the late 1980s when they brought out four valve per cylinder pent roof combustion chambers and then variable valve timing and that went in the 928 and ultimately ended up in the 924 S S2. Porsche were beginning to run out of steam with the 968 because because of the very reason I've explained the the, the downside was that um, here we were uh, 20 years later from the 924 concept and it was looking a little tired so what did they do? They brought out, I mean, Porsche uh, and Ferrari are probably the world leaders at this, and BMW. They, they blow the, uh, the dust off some parts bin cars from the competition department or something halfway, fit them to the car, and you end up with something wonderful. And this car is something wonderful. Whereas the, the, the original 968 was not well received, this instantly was well received and it became sort of performance car of the year of some of the most popular publications on the planet. It instantly transformed and, and had huge cred from the standard 968. And this is an absolute peach of a car. I haven't driven this car yet, but based on previous experience, one of these that's properly set up is one of the finest handling cars ever built. I'll say it. Um, don't just take my word for it. That was what the press said at the time. They are just fabulous to drive. This is, a, this is one of the 170 odd club sports. Um, like some that came to the UK or, or right hand drive cars that came to the UK, like some of them that came here, uh, it has the Lux pack, which actually brings back some of the things, but not all that were de deleted from the 968. So this car has got power steering, um, it's got the electric removable sunroof panel, electric windows, um, and it's also got the back seats back in it, but it's got no air conditioning, nothing like that. So it's sort of in no man's land a little bit. It's, it's, it's like a competition car that's wound back a couple of notches for the road, rather like the 2.7 RS was in the early 70s, um, or, or a lot of other uh, Porsches actually but interestingly Porsche for once instead of charging more for less did reduce the price of this car over the standard 968. The thing about these cars is the way they drive because of the the front and rear weight distribution front engine rear transaxle um, it gives them great adhesion at the back it's the classic front engine rear wheel drive layout and it's never been used as in a killer combination like this before it really is special this car um, it's it's one of the car world's hidden secrets this car thus far and um, we have got this car in for sale i'm just going to put that hat on for a moment um, we haven't quite come up with a price yet but it will be fair whatever the price is it's our instructions are to be fair with both gentle with both us, us and the seller so um, it is going to be for sale in the very near future this car um, i think it's a, a very good place to put one's money at the moment because a car of this um, pleasure to drive that ticks so many boxes you can go cruising across continents you can go for a blast on a sunday whatever it is um, there aren't many cars that tick a lot of boxes for what this car is actually selling for and they're rare i mean it's very collectible already so um, i'm going to just look at a couple of the technical aspects of the car and then we'll do our usual road test we we are we've just been recommissioning this car we've uh, done some work it's been out of storage we've brought it out of slumber and um, let's see where we go Well, this is where this car really uh, shines. And again, it, it goes back to what I was saying about development and um, evolving rather than reinventing the wheel every five minutes. Um, and this is the completely bouncing off the other end of the spectrum from that because it's essentially the same car as the, 
the wheezy Porsche 924 was in 1975. I think it was, it was launched. Um, with all of 100 brake horsepower or 120 or something. And in this car, it's actually double that, it's 240, which is hardly setting anybody's um, underwear on fire in uh, 2024, but um, it it's actually makes the car feel a surprisingly grunty car on the road because it's got a very fat, smooth torque curve uh, and a very linear power delivery, which makes it really feel quick. And it is quick, but... Um, the really the real jewel in the crown is the the chassis engineering on this car so we've got the we've got the slant four cylinder engine here with the balancer shaft and the cam belt at the front the, it's critical that the balancer shafts are set up properly I, I we used to do a lot of 944s uh, at my previous uh, business Tyrrell engineering when we did nothing but um service uh, cars like this and, and sometimes we had three or four of them in the workshop at a time and one of them came in with uh, the balancer shafts out of timing and he's actually kept breaking the power steering pump uh, stud uh, tensioning uh, stud bolt uh, on the edge of the engine i couldn't work out we couldn't work out for ages what was wrong with this it would kept it would literally snap it randomly and we discovered that the vibration set up by one of the balancer shafts being slightly out actually caused a frequency vibration in the engine that snapped the power steering tensioning bolt. So these things are critical. What is the essence of this machine? What makes what makes the absolute rings every last of those 240 horsepower out of it? And that is the suspension. As I say, it's essentially the same suspension as the 924 had all those decades ago. Um, this is McPherson strut front suspension, as it's called, and it was invented by, or it was actually refined but, and patented by a guy called Earl McPherson, um, not a member of the British aristocracy, uh, and he, American gentleman, and he um, worked for GM and then left and worked for Ford, and the first production car to have McPherson strut front suspension was the Ford Corsair of 19... Ford Zephyr, I beg your pardon, of 1950. So uh, this technology has been around a long time um, and it's surprisingly similar to what Porsche used on this car. It's a very simple uh, lower, lower arm connected to a strut um, and uh, I can explain in more detail about that and how it works very simply on the, uh, the whiteboard. We'll resort to our trusty whiteboard for a moment. Well, the McPherson strut is an absolute gift for car manufacturers, uh, and it's no wonder that countless of them have used it, uh, Porsche included, of course. So um, basically, you have a lower suspension arm, so that's the pivot in the chassis on the car, or the chassis rail, uh, lower suspension arm coming out here to a, another pivot on the other end, which is a ball joint, and then the hub assembly is there, and the wheel is here, wheel bearings, brake, etc. Um, and then the strut goes up like that into a mounting, normally inside the engine compartment at the front of the car either side called the tower and they use a coil over system. This is extremely scrappy of course. Um, and. Um, the beauty of this is that the, you've got all sorts of geometric um, possibilities here. This arm obviously swing, swivels like that, um, but you can actually alter the length of the arm, you can alter the angle of the arm, make it slightly higher or lower, you can alter the pickup point up and down. Um, and what happens is the assembly can actually, you have lots of parameters which dictate how the wheel camber works. And that is the key. So you're not just stuck with um, a sort of swing arm type arrangement. You can actually vary things so that when the wheel is dead straight, when the car is at normal ride height driving, the wheel has um, a tiny, tiny touch of negative camber at the top and the bottom um, just to, uh, to help on the road. Um, but uh, I'm exaggerating wildly there. But um, when it goes into a corner, it's preloaded to uh, take up the strain and because Porsche have made the suspension uh, they've come up with such an excellent ride handling uh, compromise 
Uh, the, the suspension hardly moves. It doesn't dive into. You've got good turning in the car. It doesn't sort of compress and all, all go horribly wrong. It's controlled by the, uh, the damper is built in here. The shock absorber is built in. The spring and shock absorber do the work. Um, but, but that Porsche were able to dictate how this wheel moves to maintain. It's all about this. It's all about the contact patch on the road and they've, they've done a lot of work around the geometry on this and that's why the 968 front suspension is absolutely brilliant. It's cheap as chips for car manufacturers to make a McPherson strut. Um, it can do what they want it to do because of all the variances in geometry. Result. Moving, moving right along, um, the torque tube driveline is another ace in the pack on this car. You've got the engine at the front, you've got the gearbox and differential unit, the transaxle at the back, connected by a solid tube with a rotating propeller shaft running in the middle of it. Um, the whole point is that weight distribution wise, it makes it almost perfect, 50% front, 50% rear. Another wonderful, um, another wonderful ingredient in the recipe of 968 Club Sport handling. So we move right along, the, the, uh, trans the torque tube and transmission um, shaft is right up here, just above the exhaust, comes into here, and then we get to the back suspension, which is another crazy thing where um, development and engineering overran uh, basic initial design. So we've got this, what's called a semi-trailing arm rear suspension here. Um, and I'm just again going to resort to the whiteboard to explain how that happens and what the advantages and disadvantages are. Well, when it comes to the back suspension, the semi trailing arm, um, <clears throat> generally speaking, causes problems. Um, and that's because uh, if this is um, the pivot of the arm, the arm comes out there, uh, two pivot points. And the arm comes out and you've got the wheel here, for argument's sake. Um, it's pivoting around that 20 degree, for example, angle, um, which means if you look at it side on, um, the arm is like that and the wheel is there. So pretty inevitably, because you've only got one, one pivot point, the arm moves up and down here and the wheel has a pre-described arc which you cannot escape from because there's only one pivot point. Um, and that is why so many German car manufacturers, uh, BMW famously um, with their semi-trailing arm back suspension were very tail happy. Um, Porsche 911s, same setup. Um, they, they all, uh, you, couldn't really, you couldn't really engineer or rework the uh, the contact patch that I was talking about on the ground so you you were stuck with the contact patch and as the car rolled um, the wheel the wheel had no choice but to pivot on a pre-described arc and that's why um, in the case of the 968 um, what Porsche did was was fit it with fairly stiff suspension but not too stiff this is the the, the ride handling compromise again, um, so that this didn't um, actually adversely affect the contact patch too much. It, the car didn't roll, causing the wheel to go like that um, when it was on its upward uh, trajectory, and actually um, you start to lose contact patch on the ground. It's 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 just a very it's it's a real cheap and cheerful uh, suspension layout, the semi trailing arm but it does work. So um, uh, it does when it's refined to within an inch of its life, which goes back to my earlier observation that Porsche really did, um, they really did refine what's basically a flawed design into something that works superbly. And that's the genius. Um, I'm now going to explain what an ideal back suspension setup looks like, but more costly. Um, and uh, we'll see, just compare and contrast. So here we have the business end of the semi trailing arm rear suspension. Um, this is a bolt here with rubber bushes, the pivot point. There's another pivot point just outside there. And um, if that is straight across the car and that is the angle of the suspension arm. So it's about 20 degrees away from being um, right across the car. 
which means that the rear wheel moves in an arc. And um, uh, as I say, we'll, we'll resort to the whiteboard just to put a bit of, uh, a bit of meat on that uh, before, we, uh, before we go any further. The ideal solution um, before the days of multi-link rear suspension, which a lot of manufacturers use now, which takes advantage of camber change, tow-in, varying tow-in, um, power on, power off, uh, bump steer, etc. All those things, they can, they can virtually write their own menu and pick off what they want to do. But before those came fashionable, as in the case of the Porsche 968, um, one of the mo more ideal systems was the um, unequal length double wishbone setup. So, uh, for example, uh, short double wishbone, long, uh, short upper wishbone, lower, um, longer lower wishbone. There's a hub here, again, um, and the wheel is there. Um, and what can happen here is you've got pivot points here on the chassis of the car and because the, they are double, manufacturers can basically place all of these wherever they want. Going back to the 1960s with the Jaguar IRS, this is one of the elegance, um, elegances, if such a word exists, of the Jaguar independent rear suspension setup, which used the drive shaft as the upper link. But um, what happens is, because you can plot how long these are, how high they're mounted, um, how, how, what, what sort of um, orientation they are to each other. Is one, is one at an angle, is one like that? You, you've got a huge amount of variances. And what happens is, instead of the wheel being um, a constant arc, as with the semi-trailing arm, you can actually account for the, the wheel going over a bump, for example. But then when the car starts to roll, it brings it a bit of camber, and you can plot a curve like that. So you have far more control over um, the, uh, the, the movement up and down and the angles that the, the hub assumes, the tyre. So you end up with a, a contact patch going round corners when the suspension is like that, uh, that the uh, tyre the is actually, um, it's actually in the right place to provide grip. Um, here and the sidewalls take up the slack there. So it's, it's a very elegant solution um, and one of the advantages of this is you don't get what's called bump steer with it either where if you, if you drive over a bump at the back end um, it, it's all of a sudden because you've got this system with the semi-trailing arm you, if it goes over a bump it alters the geometry of the wheel. With this it doesn't because it's, a lot of it is still vertical. So. Um, that's a, a synopsis, but, but really what I wanted to observe was the genius of the 968 because they've persevered and persevered and persevered with this system from the 1970s at the front and the back. But it actually works because they've developed it to within an inch of its life. Um, so clever Porsche for uh, pulling a blinder with something rudimentary and simple, but that's the way the Germans work. You bring in technology when it's needed, but you stick with the old and tried tested system when it doesn't. Great. Well, I hope that explains um, some of the, uh, the, the wonder that goes into this car from extremely humble and quite ancient beginnings um, to, uh, to making it the wonderful car that it was in the, uh, in, in the 1990s when it, uh, when it was around. Um, you'll notice <coughs> one of the other reasons why the rear suspension is able to cope with this uh, fairly basic geometry is these quite high profile tires. Um, they weren't in the 1990s, but they certainly are now. And one of the beauties of those is that the sidewalls, the actual carcass of the tire, have got quite a lot of give in them. So even if the, the, the angle of attack on the, on the road surface is not perfectly perpendicular or a little bit positive cambered to allow for the roll of the car, the sidewall actually takes up some of the, the slack on that and helps with, um, with, with road holding and, uh, and grip. If it had a superbly low modern profile tire on, it would be, the handling would be far more tetchy at the limit and far less forgiving. So that's sort of there as a, just to take up the slack a bit, uh, really. But um, enough of all this, let's take the car for a drive. Well, out on our charmingly surfaced test road, um, which I suspect is probably going to rattle some of my teeth out, uh, it's that bad now, 
but uh, we do need to find a new one. But um, it is just a very, it's got a real visceral connected feel to it, this car. Um, for all its Lux Pack um, credentials, it still feels very planted on the road. Even the power steering is lovely. It's delightful. It's, uh, it's full of feel. It has just the right amount of caster or self-centering effect. Um, it really is. Uh, it's all there. And you can just feel this car wants to go. It's encouraging me to, um, to press on. It's, uh, yeah. But by the same token, because partly because it's got the Lux Pack and uh, it still hasn't got any air conditioning, but uh, it's got the removable sunroof panel and the extra back seats, which the, uh, some of the club sports did not have. For, it, it, it sort of, you feel as though you could do a, a long trip in this car. It's, uh, it could be said that it's a nice compromise. It's the right compromise. Oh, it's just lovely. You think your way around corners in this car, not steer. The ride is firm, but not uh, excessively so. Um, it is just a very satisfying car. Um, I'm not particularly pushing, pushing on in it yet, but uh, it just, I can't, I can't get over how, how you know, it's, uh, I've worked on these for, for many years and um, the 944 before them, and even the 924 and the 924 Turbo before that. I've worked on most of the variants of this genre, and um, I, I, I've forgotten how good they actually are. This is, uh, this is a very special car, and they're not dear. For what they are and the driving experience they give, um, I don't think they're dear at the moment. There are a couple of things I've noticed on this car which I'd want to put right before we did uh, let, let its next custodian at it. One is the gear change, which is a little bit, got a little bit of lost motion in it, which is not uncommon for this model, actually, or all, all of this um, variant. The, uh, the linkage goes way back to this, the left-hand side of the gearbox, if my memory serves me correctly, and it actually has bob weights on it to help you get that positive gear change action. It actually has weight to sort of increase the inertia and the positivity of it. Um, and uh, this has just got a little bit of sideways play. It's only, it's only nylon bushes. Um, it's all fixable. And yeah, I mean, I'm just cruising along. I'm doing um, about 35 miles an hour here, 1800 RPM. But, you know, you put your foot down and it's got a bit of grunt about it already. Just a lovely smooth power curve. Um, it's a gutsy engine, three litres. But again, with a car weighing round about 1350 kilos in this spec, it's not, it's not heavy. Um, yeah, I will just open it up. There's a nice little bend coming here and it would be rude not to uh, put it through its paces a little bit. So let's do that. Oh, lovely. Yes, that's what it's all about. Beautiful handling, precision. You know exactly what's going on. You can choose your angle on the protractor of exit. Uh, I'm not going to go too mad because this is not my car, it's a customer's. But, um, I mean, it just tracks straight and true beautifully. Doesn't pull over to the left. Um, just really perfect steering geometry. Uh, beautiful brakes. Um, and that lovely engine with just a sil smooth, silky power delivery from under 2,000 RPM, right the way up to the red line at six and a half. Just, um, yeah, very sweet. Uh, it's not a car I would automatically choose this. I, uh, I like sort of even more off-beam cars than this, such as big Luxo barges with huge horsepower and um, 
things like that. But it is it, it is a very pleasurable place to be. Just drop it drop it down a cog or two. Just wonderful. Oh yes. Fantastic. How much fun can you have for whatever uh, amount of money this car is going to be on the market for? And uh, The owner has actually said to me, I don't want to break any records with the price, I just want it to be sensible. So when we do put it on the market, that's exactly what it will be, sensible. But um, yeah, there we go. This is what it's all about. This is what this car is all about. Just, it's, <laughs> you just point and shoot. It's like a fine pistol, fine gun. You just, not that I'm used to using guns, <clears throat> but um, you just absolutely decide where you want to go. And there it is. Just lovely. All that engineering, all that development, all those generations from um, a, uh, a sort of VW concept to this. Um, yeah, I, I fully endorse um, the the statement that this is one of the finest handling cars ever built. It is just beautiful. You think your way around corners. Um, I just can't stop. Lovely. Yeah, the the um, the way, uh, as I was saying earlier, the, the, the Germans. One of the reasons why they are so successful is they are not afraid of refining, developing, moving up. Um, they've done that with the Golf since when the Golf came out, 1975, 76, through whatever it is, eight generations now. Uh, just r gradually ratcheting up the technology, everything. Um, and this is a shining example of that, really, taking something uh, good and uh, just gradually fine-tuning it, actually the, to the point where they reached a dead end with this. This was this and the 928 were the last front-engine rear-wheel drive Porsches possibly ever built. And um, what's not to like about that? Yes, it's a bit... It's, it's not a, a Rolls-Royce ride, but the ride handling compromise is something else. It really is. I mean, I'm just literally driving this on my fingertips. It's just lovely. Um, it, it, it is like it's on rails. That's the best way I can describe it. It's just, uh, it just does what you, you think your way around. Um, it's, uh, and because the handling is so pin sharp, uh, it's, uh, it, you can forgive a little bit of choppiness on the ride. It's, you could cover distances, as I said earlier in this. It's not, uh, it's not painful that you get out of it after a few miles and think, oh, that was hard work, I'm exhausted, etc. Yeah, Yet, you can ratchet up the level of involvement from one, drive, cruising along a motorway or whatever, to 10, taking it on a back road like this, and anywhere in between. That is the genius of this car. The fact that it is, it does whatever you want it to do. It can be Jekyll or it can be Hyde.
It's so hard not to do that in this car. It really is. It just says, come on, let's have a bit of fun. Absolutely wonderful. Well, that concludes another uh, Tyrrell Classic Workshop video. Hope you've enjoyed it. Please remember to like and subscribe and we'll be back with something else very soon.